I got engaged in Hadramut because it was the perfect kind of terrain and domain that was rich and um, undiscovered, uh, almost virgin country of mud brick architecture. And I found myself in front of a huge wealth of um, uh, cultural um, civilization, if you like, and a depth and meaning I have written about which uh, was um, very moving for me architecturally, moving both intellectually and professionally. And this is what inspired me to want to engage with the builders, engage with the people, understand better the uh, savoir-faire, if you want, understand better how they managed to do this genius type of uh, designs in uh, high-rise buildings of seven and eight stories high that were built in sun-dried mud brick. So we're talking here of both a design concept and a technology that was uh, extremely well composed in the sense that it was still relevant and contemporary in um, 1982 when I first went there. And I felt this is the world I belong to. The dignity of these people is in constructing houses. They achieve this by constructing a house. The minute they uh, amass a certain amount of uh, money or they save a bit of money, they construct a house. It's the first thing they do. They construct a house and continue constructing the house because the house is part of the architecture is not separate from, from the terrain. The architecture is part of the ecosystem. An entire uh, comprehensive, integral uh, system that operates with the environment, with the uh, ecological factors, with the social factors, and with the urban organization and, if you like, urban order. And once you break away from that integral system that they knew how to construct and operate and develop and be a part of and grow with um, and walk out into these cubes of, that are being constructed for them out of cement, you find that they are at complete loss. They lose everything in the process. These houses are being built um, in, in arid lands. They're not close to their fields. Um, they, they don't have spaces for their animals. I mean, they still, women still go out with their animals every morning with their goats and sheep and, and graze and spend the whole day in, in, in the mountains and come back. So it's, it's, it's a system that is, um, um, operating in, in, a, in a certain equilibrium and once and of course the equilibrium is being uh, disturbed all the time and this is why I find that one of um, our roles or my role and the role of the foundation is to help establish and give confidence to the people that you're on the right track and we shall try and fund and bring in any projects that will assist you to kind of uh, resuscitate any of these buildings that will go otherwise. I have always maintained that I am an architect and that's what I do. I do architecture. The architecture I do combines both research and design. The research that we do is, is uh, uh, applied research. It's not research that is the just theoretical. The rules have to be written, we have to understand the language, we have to understand the vocabulary that is used in the architecture. However, this requires research. Design requires research to understand the lines, to understand the forces, to understand the um, uh, engineering of these buildings, to understand the depth, to understand heights and widths and, and bricks and how they operate. All of this requires a form of research on our part because the builders, the master builders and the craftsmen operate without the need for them to refer to texts or references. I always looked at what architecture I was working with as something contemporary and present. And the reason I was uh, enthused by it and the reason why it moved me so much to develop it and work with the people on it is because I wanted this to be a vision for the future. 
I was I wasn't I wasn't going to reinvent anything. I just wanted this culture to be maintained and developed as a strategy for the future. Everything that Hassan Fathi established, to my mind, is still viable. The language uh, at the time when I was working or studying with him or being with him was uh, a break for me a breakthrough, a complete breakthrough, the language and the vocabulary. Now I look back and it, it touches me more than I find it because I know it by heart. I know it almost by heart. But in the process of going through his papers and looking at them, I was thinking the other day that, you know, these are things everybody, every architect, every student of architecture must read. Just must read as background reading, you know, it's like a, it's, it's part of the literature of architecture that has to be read and understood. And it's so well written and so easily written that I think all students of architecture will benefit from it, irrespective of whether they agree or disagree, you know, and disagreeing is very important. But also there's this other way of thinking, which we have to bring in into our understanding of how we deal with architecture. And the worst thing that happened to architecture is that it has been confined and compartmentalized in these different styles and trends like the um, um, Frank Giri, Nouvelle, um, Stefano Boeri, you know, how people how people think, how people create, and they all have to relate to each other. Well, sometimes they don't have to. And if we need to think of the future, we also need to think that this creative process cannot happen independently from communities. And this is what Hassan Fathi was concerned with. And there has never been uh, uh, more, uh, a better design approach, I believe, to the question of designing for the, the peasants in the villages or for the poor in the cities uh, in the same way that Hassan Fathi tried to tackle the work. When I think of him, I find myself smiling. He was a wonderful man.